So I'm here with Laura and Jane, overjoyed on a lovely Sunday morning for me. So they're over in the United Kingdom, the land of tea and crumpets. Just a just a beautiful place that I haven't been to in a long, long time. To talk about your new book, is that what we're doing? That's what we're doing. We okay. we've made a book. It's it's called it Who Hunts the Whale. Uh, we we've been writing it together for like the last year, year and a half now. <laughs> Has it been that long? I feel like I first heard about it some time ago. And Laura, it may have been because you were stewing on ideas that would go into this book for some time. But I also could just be remembering things totally wrong, <laughs> yes. which wouldn't wouldn't be the first time. We'd had the idea and we'd been talking to a publisher about it, but it hadn't yet been funded. And like we hadn't got into fully into the weeds on writing it yet. Right. That makes sense. So it's something near and dear to your heart that, as I know from dabbling in creative projects, it becomes sort of a survival of the fittest in your own brain. And only the ideas you're really most passionate about will eventually be the project that you keep working on and rise to the top and actually get published and and here you both are i have so many questions about it but for the listener's sake we should probably recap what is the book about uh it's about a young woman who gets her dream job working in the video game industry she's not a coder she's not an artist so she just wanted to just work for the big company for the, who make all the games she's uh, ever played pretty much so uh, she's really excited to get there and almost immediately starts to realize that corporate nonsense is, is very much in the way of the dream. The polish is almost immediately ruined. And then as things go on, it's more about how can I, how can I help save all these people who are in this terrible situation under these terrible executives who do awful things. But it's also funny. <laughs> well, it's, it attempts to be like a it, at times pretty serious but at times pretty light-hearted um satirical look at the fact that the more that you learn about how video games are made particularly at the biggest you know triple a studios the more you start to realize the things you love are often made on the back of a lot of uncredited unpaid unsupported labor and that it's important to understand that and to understand what we can do about that mm. Yeah. So it is a book that comes from the heart, tries to have fun with some unfun stuff. And that's the only way to get anyone to actually pay attention to it, as I've learned myself over the years, but also shows your love for games underneath it all. And I think that's one of the things I'm most excited about in terms of reading the book is seeing how you infused your love of the, the games that are made by these studios with your knowledge of and disdain for some of the things they do while they're they're making them. Jane has this amazing background filled with colors and feelings. And what is what is some of the stuff? Is that a Megazord? Yeah, we've got loads of Megazords. Um, it, it says from queer separate... right next to it. Oh, yeah. It's like Megazord queer. I, I wish that was a real Megazord. <laughs> it says queer, queer cuties 9731. <laughs> so uh, tell me about some of the stuff that you uh, maybe without pointing too strong of a finger though that's entirely up to you of course some of the stuff that you like that maybe inspired this book either other satirical books or maybe triple a games that were made in a way that might be similar to the way the book describes how games are made. I don't know if you want to start those fights, but it's totally up to you. I open the open it up to you to see if you want to point those fingers. I think it's a, a general vibe about what's been happening in the industry for, or, or been known about of the industry for the last few years. Obviously, we get we we hear a lot of stuff from your friend Steph. We hear amazing in-depth articles from people like Jason Schreier, mm. just talking about the how bad it can be in the industry from the point of view of someone actually doing any work as opposed to just sitting in an office and, and making bad decisions about project management. So it, it was a lot of that stuff and a lot of wanting to just take a dig at that. Maybe educate some people, maybe just make some people laugh and maybe make some more people think about Think about it for more than the five seconds that usually happens whenever one of these stories breaks. Yeah, it's true. How many times have we seen 
a massive story on how poorly people are treated at a big studio and then new shiny game gets announced and the the focus on the people gets totally lost so it's that balance between focusing on the people and the games that i'm really most excited about it's 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 definitely one of the things that really sort of pushed us towards writing the book. Like I know we talked about the idea for a long time, but for me, the big impetus of this needs to be the next thing we work on was um without without pointing any figures too directly, um, there was that summer a couple of years ago where we really started to find out, particularly around sort of Activision Blizzard and Ubisoft and a lot of those companies, some of the stuff that was going on. And it was seeing like two or three months after those stories broke uncritical news coverage or like reviews of those games that in no way acknowledged like the very recent stories that had not yet had any actual resolution to them about um executive mistreatment of employees and feeling pretty defeated as someone that had been like trying to talk week in week out about the things that were going on and keep them relevant in news discussions seeing how many people were just responding with yeah, but I don't want to feel depressed when I want to play the thing I want to play. Yeah. And like we've seen that crop up again and again in time since. Like we're releasing this book right around the release of Hogwarts Legacy, which not to get into too much, has had a lot of people going, yeah, but I don't want to feel bad when I play the video game I'm excited to play. And I think like that feeling was at the core of like what we wanted to address that sort of audience apathy around Mm. uh, mistreatment of workers but then the book is also like uh, structurally it's um it's got shades of Bridget Jones's diary in terms of it's sort of like written as diary entries from a single character um perspective it's got little bits of books like uh, microsurfs which was a a satire of working within uh, Microsoft and Silicon Valley in the in the late 90s it's all of that dressed up with a decade of me having been in the games industry, seeing all of the excessive, exaggerated pomp and circumstance that games are dressed up in. Mm, yeah. When I was hosting the Destructoid show 10 or so years ago in San Francisco, everybody working on the front lines was poor. And then we would go to these events held by giant publishers where there was like $90 pieces of cheese and just like ridiculous amounts of money thrown at trying to make the games seem like they were a big deal but the people were not seen as a big deal or or even really key to the games being being good so I'm wondering if there's going to be like a cheese party scene in the book. I'm so I'm chomping at the bit to find out more about the book. If there's going to be a game in the book that's described that the main character really loves. And maybe that's a game that I hope someone will read the book and then like make that game. Like I'm all I'm all a flutter with the with there's, the possibilities. Without saying too much, there's a lot of very idealistic discussion of games as art from the perspective of people that just love games as a medium and there's also a lot of discussion of triple a annual release push them out the door big budget generic titles that have exactly the kind of promotional vibe that you will be familiar with from a decade ago being in the games industry (laughs) and that's where i often get in trouble with these things is i don't like a ton of triple a games these days i think the Mm -hmm. last one i truly like loved was resident evil 4 which came out on the gamecube good choice (laughs) sure it was and i like some triple a games that have come out since then but that was the last one that i was like this game is like deep in my bones now like i'm gonna love this forever so when i criticize the way triple a games are made people are often like well you don't like these games anyway so who cares but you both really love AAA games. Laura, you came on to talk about Elden Ring not that long ago, which had, I guess, a fair amount of crunch in the making of it, which then bummed me out to hear about. It's a depressing reality at this point that I feel like I I can't enjoy games the way I used to anymore because I have established that I want to try and care about the conditions that go on within these companies. So often I will start playing a game, get like a week or so into playing it, be like, I'm really enjoying it, 
and that's when the news will drop that there was huge crunch on it. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes it's as early as I'll be watching a trailer for a game and I'll be like, oh, this looks really exciting. And someone in Twitch chat will be like, oh, yeah, no, did you not hear about the terrible thing that happened with that company? I'm like, it's so hard to find things I can love. Mm. And, you know, that's difficult from a perspective of someone that does critical work on games. It's difficult if you pay attention to how they're made. It's tiring just wanting to enjoy things. Yeah. And then trying to keep it all in your head. There's all these things I'm sort of... Am I I buying from that company or not? I can't remember. And then occasionally (laughs) getting it wrong, saying, I really enjoyed this thing, and people going, but the thing you said you'd never do. Oh, Uh, there's so many of them, and I forgot one. I'm really sorry. I can't remember who it was. Somebody fancy said that ethical consumerism under capitalism is impossible or something but we're we're trying to be as ethical as we can i think while still existing yeah it's <laughs> it's it's one of those that like i see a lot of people use it there's no ethical consumption under capitalism as a shield from being critical of their mm-hmm. own choices as a consumer particularly around pieces of media but like the the, the classic gotcha is Oh, you criticize you, you criticize people for buying games made with lots of crunch, but you own a phone that was probably made with bad practices. And it's like there's a difference between purchasing things that you unfortunately have very little alternative to in a modern world, be that a smartphone that is required for most jobs in a modern in a mm. modern life, or trying to avoid buying from companies that are huge multinationals that have bought up dozens of subsidiaries under them and you might not even know you're buying from the bad company Mm -hmm. that's a very different matter from i knowingly bought a video game from a big triple a company that i know is bad and that has been repeatedly proven to be bad but i'm hand waving away the morality of that choice because i know everything's a little bit bad so i don't have to feel bad about choosing consumerism and entertainment over someone's uh, having good working conditions yeah yeah that's right and there's so many games out there but people get so attached to their brands and again i go back to your megazord jane and your your gundam and your ponies and it's so easy to when you're a super empathetic person you can really feel empathy and love for these creative ideas that people had gundam my little pony like they feel very real to you but then when you find out the real story behind the people making them well anyway before i retread that ground i want to make sure that we talk about what it was like to write this book together i'm not sure if you've written a book together like this and how the creative process with your with a a partner romantic partner and or a creative partner can be kind of a wild ride in itself yeah so it was it, I mean, the whole idea came from a skit we regularly do, regularly do on our podcast, which is Queer and Pleasant Strangers. And it was just two execs talking about how they're going to abuse their staff this week, possibly <laughs> resulting in flogging, who knows. And it was an idea of like, hey, what if we just about to span this out into a whole book? And then hmm, we sat down one afternoon and worked out, okay, what is an average year in video games. What are the the big important things? So we hear a lot about layoffs at the beginning of the year to try and get profits up. We hear about the early uh, expos and and events, things like uh, GDC, and then later on uh, E3, things like that. Sort of moving through the year, what are the big events? Desperately trying to get the game out before Black Friday because that's going to be where they make the most sales. And then sort of how we we wrap that in wrap our narrative around that, and that really helped having that framework. And then Laura worked from that and built just a skeleton. Pretty much went through the entire book start to finish in one sitting. Wow! And then I went in afterwards and just fleshed out with sort of more of the character stuff, uh, refining some of the conversations because Laura very much does like factual stuff, and I'm more like fiction writer, so. It helped that between us, we had those two skills and it it was good to be able to bounce off of each other. And then when we didn't have ideas for how a conversation would go, we'd just sit down and just do the characters at each other and and record it and largely, largely just use a transcribed version of that as the the final script. I'm just trying to contain 
the adorableness feeling I'm having. And, and the way you describe it, it sounds so idyllic. Like the, the people dream of a partnership where, oh, well, you know, I, I don't like jam and they don't <laughs> like toast. So, you know, I give them my jam and they give me my toast and we split up everything and get it done together. And then we improv. I I, I was I was really happy with how smoothly the process went. It, I think it really helps that we went in with a sort of understanding of what e each other's strengths and weaknesses were, because I think that both of us would have probably not felt comfortable doing a novel alone. Both mm. of us know that there are things we struggle with uh, in terms of fiction writing, but we also know each other's strengths. And as, as Jane said, I was fairly comfortable with there is a blank page in front of me. I need to fill it and get us from A to B. And I was happy to go, cool, we've got the sort of annualized milestones to wrap things around. We know what the the general like uh, emotional narrative we want to hit is. Cool. I will get words onto paper that get us at roughly the right like pacing so that chapters are about the same length, so that we are hitting the points we want to build toward in the right order, and that we have like a skeleton of a story. I'm no good at describing places or people or uh, the personality stuff that you need to make a book like that not just come across as a dry account of events. And Jane went through and really breathed life into that. Like, Jane is not necessarily super comfortable with there is a blank page in front of me. I have to make the story be on the page. But once that skeleton is there, Jane was like, oh, yeah, I know I can... I can liven this up into a bunch of memorable people and places and conversations that make it feel alive. And I think together we created something really that I'm really proud of. It's just, I'm silenced by the, the adorableness and the, and the wonder. Hope adorable doesn't sound too like childlike, I don't but I, so. I adore <laughs> what you did. I adore that you're doing it. I'm so excited for people to read it. I want people to take a chance on it. How can people find it? Where can oh, who's that? The, this Jane is a Laura. tiny Laura. <laughs> I have a tiny woolen Laura. She sits on my desk and inspires me. Uh, where can they get the book? Unbound.com slash book slash whale. There is available from all good bookshops, especially ones that aren't Amazon. Definitely, definitely check those out. <laughs> uh, it's bookshop.org. We're available so. internationally and 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 they have the book. And you don't have to give any money to Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and is it is it uh, in print and ebook? Yeah, I believe there is an ebook. Print and ebook, yeah, yeah. That's the way things are done these days. Jeez, is there more you wanted to talk about in terms of the book, making the book? Anything else you wanted to say? I don't want to pressure you, but I don't want to cut you off either. If there's, I, I mean, the only other thing I think I wanted to talk about, and you sort of hit on this earlier, was um, the, we wrote this book as a satire, and that's a difficult thing to do when you're dealing with like kind of heavy topics by the time you get to the end of it but like a big part of why we did that was just trying to get people in the door and a lot of choices we make in the book are about trying to make sure that this is accessible to a very specific kind of person hopefully which is your sort of annual triple a video game uh enjoyer who doesn't really want to sit there and like just from the off be told okay, here's just a list of terrible thing after terrible thing after terrible thing that's happened in the games industry. Feel bad about it. And trying to go, by having some fun in the space of, um, you know, starting with exaggerated just accounts of silly things you sort of know about in the games industry, and then moving on to exaggerated um, excesses that don't seem... That, that aren't necessarily in the realm of things going too wrong yet, and people are like, oh yeah, oh, I know E3 is a big, excessive, si silly show where nonsense things happen, and sort of playing around in those kind of spaces and getting people used to the excesses uh, in a safer space, and then going, mm. okay, now we need to talk seriously. There is a lot that needs to be taken seriously, and hopefully getting people to a point where even if some of the things we've described are a little exaggerated, people will go, surely it can't be that bad. Go Google and go, oh, it really, it's not that far off, huh? It, mm -hmm. it, that's really not that much of an exaggeration. And I think that's the line we were trying to walk is that while we are, you know, being a little exaggerated and satirical in places that 
we're clear enough with the satire we do that if someone goes, is that a real thing? They will come across real stories and go, what I had assumed was a gross exaggeration is really not that far off where the industry is today. And hopefully that'll open some eyes. Yeah. I mean, we had that conversation with our development editor who was saying like, well, this, this seems a little bit overblown. Don't you think? And we were like, here are some articles. (laughs) And, um, (laughs) It was a good proof of concept that it got people asking questions that we could then put point links and go, yeah, no, this this uh, game developer talking about um, uh, terrible monetization practices at GDC. Oh, yeah, no, there's like three different talks we could point you to that are really like basically there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fact that you know your stuff will give the book the capacity to reflect the truth in a way that will be exciting i think for a lot of people who are in this niche in this sort of subculture that wonders like does anyone else know that this is what's going on so the book will validate that it'll give an inside scoop as to what's really going on from people who know you two know more than a lot of us do and it will be a fun read i just reviewed the book I have not yet read the book, but I am that confident that that's what you've done. And I can't wait to see what you did. I hope we have achieved that. That's what we're going for. Yeah. <laughs> well, Enjoy unless... all the ridiculousness, all the all the made up uh, energy drinks and all the made up video game names we, we worked out. <laughs> <laughs> it's so lovely to have you both on. I hope it's not the last time. And thanks again for for talking to us. Thank you for having us.